Hello and welcome back to The Unthinkable. With the retelling of these stories, I tried to select and choose events that are a bit more strange or out of the ordinary to present here on the channel, and I believe today's episode is one of those stories. I want to warn you that if you're sensitive to subject matters regarding assault, abuse, or foul and grotesque language, then you may want to listen with caution. Viewer discretion is advised. It's 2022, and 17-year-old high school student Zion Foster is a young and vibrant resident of East Point, Michigan, and daughter to Sierra Milton and James Royster. And aside from the typical problems of an average 17-year-old black girl growing up in the city, Zion Foster is also experiencing other emotional hurdles, including going through a case of extreme rebellion. Now, a lot of quote-unquote experts will tell you that children growing up at some point will go through a stage of rebellion of some form. But this wasn't just a mild case of the I don't want to's that Zion was going through. Her case was really on the extreme side of things. She not only dabbled in the use of marijuana and recreational drugs, but also due to her not wanting to adhere to the rules and restrictions of her mom, she began running away from home. She would disappear for hours and sometimes days at a time. Often, she would show up at her grandmother's home and stay with her for a time. A few of these incidents even resulted in the authorities being contacted, thinking that she hadn't just run away, but that she was missing or that something had happened to her. But I don't think anyone close to Zion were prepared to actually face the reality that one of these times that Zion had gone missing, would be the last. We can assume that January 4th of 2022 was like any other ordinary day at home for Zion. But later on that evening, she tells her mother Sierra that she's leaving for a few hours to go hang out with her favorite cousin, Jalen. Now on its own, that's no cause for concern. This was a thing of common practice, so no need to sound the alarm for Zion's mom, Sierra. It's just another ordinary evening. Zion and Jalen were close after all, and they'd apparently hung out together plenty of times before. And with her daughter already going through a bit of a rough time at home, at least in this situation, Sierra could feel comfortable knowing who she was with and where she was. So when Jalen arrives at the family's home to pick up Zion, there's no cause for concern. That is, until the evening turns into the late night hours and those late night hours turn into morning with no sign of Zion returning home. Her mother is initially concerned as any parent would be so she makes some calls around the city to Zion's usual hangout spots, family and whatnot, which also includes her favorite cousin Jalen. But when Sierra contacts Jalen, he says something to Sierra that seems kind of odd. He tells her that he hasn't seen Sierra at all. Though this is a weird admission to Sierra at the time, she's more concerned with finding her daughter. So Sierra attempts to look for her on her own. When her search is unable to turn up anything, she decides to contact both the East Point and Detroit Police Departments. Now for reference, East Point is approximately around 24 to 30 minutes away from Detroit, so not very far at all. Zion's mother, Sierra, informs the police that her last known whereabouts were supposedly spent with her favorite cousin, from what she knew anyway. Which was weird, because now, that same cousin was denying seeing Zion at all that night. So the police do what they do. They trace Zion's cell phone ping signature, and they find out that her phone's last known position is somewhere in Detroit. So, the Detroit police step in and decide to give Jalen Brazier, that favorite cousin, a visit at his home. The same home that he shares with his pregnant girlfriend at the time. 
But Zion's mom is not about to sit at home on her hands and wait. She also shows up at Jalen's door looking for answers. But she's surprised when Jalen tells her that not only did he not see her that night, but that he hasn't seen or communicated with Zion in over three years. A fact that is impossible considering Jalen Brazier had just been in Sierra's driveway giving her a hug. She immediately knew in the pit of her stomach that something was off. Sierra then says that Jalen offers to show her surveillance footage of his home to prove that what he's saying is factual. But when he pulls the footage, she notices that there are what appears to be gaps in the recordings. Meanwhile, investigators are working to uncover the truth behind the scenes and all of the circumstantial evidence keeps leading them back to just one person of interest, Jalen Brazier. And believe me, it turns out that there's a mountain of circumstantial evidence. So the police questioned Jalen and initially he maintains that he had no idea of where his cousin was. But the police begin the process of uncovering that CCTV footage, as well as the cell phone text records and timestamps of Zion's cell phone pings. And it becomes increasingly clear that Jalen has been lying to the authorities. Those gaps in surveillance footage that I mentioned earlier that Jalen was so eager and willing to show both Zion's mom and Zion's boyfriend were later filled in through surveillance from a neighbor's doorbell ring camera from across the street that shows Jalen arriving back at home and exiting his vehicle. But he's not alone. There's another figure that gets out of the passenger seat, a figure that investigators believe wholeheartedly is Zion Foster. Good afternoon, ma'am. I just want to ask you a few questions about some video that has been admitted as um, Exhibit 21. And um, if, if you can just look on the screen behind you briefly, um, are you um, familiar with those files that are depicted in Exhibit 21? Yes. And um, I'm just going to open up the first one just kind of as an example. Um, Back in um, January of 2022, um, where did you live relative to um, these homes that are depicted in the video? Where the camera's coming from. Okay, so right across the street. Mm -hmm. And um, can you describe the, the sort of camera um, that was uh, where you lived? It's a, um, a wave camera, and I had it sitting in my uh, window sill. Okay, and um, did, did you have the ability to uh, access recordings from that camera system? Yes. And how would you uh, be able to access recordings from that camera? Through the application. And would that be on your phone? Yes. Um, and at some point, did you uh, go into the app on your phone and access some recordings from January 4th and January 5th of 2022. Yes. And did you do anything to sort of uh, preserve or capture those recordings? Um, I just saved them. Okay. I just saved them. And um, the, the camera was, was it your understanding the camera was continuously recording or would it only record at, at certain points in time? Um, it only records at certain points in time. So if it like ca captures a motion, um, then it'll start recording. Okay, and the recordings that you uh, saved, um, did you do anything with those recordings at some point? Uh, I provided them to the mother. And um, the, are you, when you say the mother, are you referring to Zion Foster's mother? Yes. Um, and um, if you could just explain briefly, what were the, I guess, the circumstances under which you provided the recordings to her? Um, I was looking out my window and I saw um, a group across the street um, and I had went over there to see what was going on and she had told me that they were... Objection to whatever was said here. So yeah, I guess without getting into anything she said. Um, so you, you, um, you saw her in the area, is that fair to say? Yes. And at that point you provided her the, the videos? Yes. 
but due to the time of night, the low light illumination and distance of the recording taking, they're unable to say with 100% certainty that the two individuals seen on camera are in fact Jalen and Zion. But for the first time when presented with the evidence, Jalen realizes that his denial of ever being with Zion that night is beginning to paint a terrible picture. So he changes his story. And this is where things begin to get very, very dark. The story Jalen leads with is that he picks up Zion from a home and they drive back to his house. Again, a home he shares with his pregnant girlfriend at the time. But on this night, that pregnant girlfriend is at work. More on that in a bit. So he picks Zion up, takes her back to his house, where they start to smoke up a little marijuana. And here's where the story starts to take some unbelievable twists and turns. Jalen Brazier eventually admits to something happening the night he brought Zion back to his house. For this next part of the story, I'm going to use Jalen Brazier's words exactly. I did turn myself in. Yes, I lied, but I was not in the right state of mind. Um, there was no way for me to prepare for a situation like that. I was I'm scared. Not, I was... I'm not totally clear on the situation. Uh -huh. uh, and the report is rather sketchy with respect to the situation. And I will fill your honor in on some of those details. I appreciate it. Uh, but what it, the report suggests is that you had contact with the individual. Uh, the police questioned you regarding that contact. You didn't tell them the truth associated with the contact. Uh, then you once confronted with information that you were not telling the truth, came forward and told them that you disposed of the body. I mean, that's all. That leaves a whole lot out there that's unaccounted for from the court's perspective. But they, what circumstances are you talking about? Um, well, when she died, um, we were, it was just <laughs> random. Like, I, from my perspective, like, from my end of it. What, what do you mean? I was... Terrified. Literally from that point on, I didn't know what to do. I wasn't in the right state of mind for anything. And I turned myself in. They didn't present me with anything. I, after getting my thoughts together. So did you explain how through, she passed? I don't know exactly how she passed, what caused her to pass. I just know one minute she was cool, she was fine. She laid back for a minute. Next, next thing I know, she's just, she, she was dead. I don't know what caused it. I did not cause it or anything like that. I reacted stupidly off of fear and panic like I've never felt before in my life. Literally. Who? Well, I mean, people are sitting around and somebody just passes. I mean, did you think about calling 911 or something like that? No, not at the time. Um, I, we were smoking. We were on marijuana as well. So my, it just, my mental state wasn't in any like logical spectrum. I was just immediately just terrified. Like that's the only words I can use to describe so, the moment. Is, is, are you telling me that you're stoned, she's stoned, you think she dies and then you dispose of the body? Just like that? That was your choice? I sat for a minute and just, I didn't know what to do. I was like, I just did not know what to do. It's like. I mean, the first thing that came to your mind, I'm trying to understand with the limited information I have that this person passed away in your presence and your first thought is, well, I got to get My rid of the body. My first thought was how bad it looked to start with. It's like, how do I explain like what happened? I don't know what she died or what it caused but her to die. It, and it just a lot of possible possibility just popped in my head. And I was just reacting off of just innate fear. Just, I don't know. Literally, I don't do anything. I, I just didn't know what to do. Literally, I literally did not know what to do. I sat for at least 10 minutes sitting there. Like, what do I do? Who do I call? My kids are upstairs. We just got into this place after struggling for like two years to get it and everything is falling down. I, I won't have any conversation in this court. And I wish I could take it back. 
I would have called the ambulance, called her mom, because her mom's so sweet. Her mom is so sweet. I just knew. I wish I could take it back. Nobody been in the situation. At the very least, they had figured like, okay, this happened, confirm this. And everybody has some sore peace right now. You know? But I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> it's not something and you know, like in life you, you, you try to mentally prep for a lot of situations. But when one that you just would never have even thought to happen just happens. And you're like, wow, immediately the first thing comes to your mind is everything about to lose, how it's going to affect your kids, your life in general. And then after that, how it's flipped when whoever, it, it, it's like play, play telephone and change many times. Facebook, everything, just a lie hitting me at once. So I had to just take time and try to get my thoughts together because I was on panic mode ever since that happened. Her mom at one point talked to me and I couldn't bring myself, but your daughter just died. What do I do? And I can't even explain it. What happened? I just can tell you my honest reaction. <laughs> now he was saying, okay, we were together that night, but we were just doing a little recreational tree smoking. And out of nowhere, she just, you know, had a seizure and died. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of story your child makes up when you ask them directly why the toilet is clogged with toys from their room. You know what I'm talking about. The old, it just happened line of defense. So needless to say, the investigators were not buying his story and neither was Zion's mother, Sierra. And over the course of the next couple of weeks and months, Jalen's story as to what exactly happened that night would go through some wild changes over time. But investigators didn't really have much else to go on aside from Jalen's word. I spent quite a bit of time listening to Jalen's testimony and what is apparent to me is that he thought he was smarter than he actually was. But most criminals do. So nobody's buying any of his story because logically nobody just starts smoking marijuana and suddenly die. So he eventually tells the police that he was lying about the type of drugs they were doing that night, right? And this new admission of illegal use of drugs had to be what caused Zion's spontaneous death. So investigators asked the only logical question next, which was, well, what did you do when she died randomly in front of you? He said that uh, my baby just died. And then that he threw her in a dumpster. Like she was trash. Foster's mom says Brazier helped post flyers and was there for emotional support in the early stages of Zion's disappearance. Then, in a stunning twist, East Point police arrested Brazier. His mother reached out to me and told me that, you know, we are both hurting. No. That's impossible. You hurt for one reason and I hurt in a measure that you won't experience. One thing that always manages to send a chill down my spine while watching these types of interviews is how casual and cavalier some of these people talk about the horrible things that they've done, completely devoid of emotion and feeling. And remember, he's saying this about someone he personally knew for years. So the police have Jalen take them to the exact spot he claimed he dumped Zion's body. And as they pop open the lid, they don't find any sign of Zion Foster. When you arrived at that area, did you have any sort of interaction with uh, Mr. Brazier? Yes. And um, what was the nature of that interaction? He was to identify the dumpster that he put Zion Foster in. Okay, and was that interaction something that was recorded on video? Yes, it was on the officer's body worn camera. Right. 
buy it right in front of it. And once again, just like that, the authorities are essentially back at square one in the search for Zion, who was now presumed to be dead. That harmless story he told is what Jalen Frazier wanted you and everyone else listening to believe. So Jalen Frazier goes to court and he is consequently sentenced to 23 months to four years in prison on the charge of lying to a peace officer in a violent crime investigation. However, the sentencing judge stated that he felt the charges should have been a lot more. But things are much deeper than this. After serving only about nine months of his sentence, he was released and he returned home. But you all remember how I told you that Jalen Frazier is somebody who thought he was the sharpest tool in the shed. See, during his time spent in prison, his calls were being monitored, which was something that he obviously considered since he resorted to using code names and phrases to talk about the case with his then pregnant girlfriend. He assumed that as long as there were no quote, big developments, i.e. the authorities finding Zion's body, that he would be okay and he would eventually be released. But in order to get to the details of what actually happened, I sat through over four hours of testimony and court proceedings, listening to both the prosecutor and the defense. And let me tell you, this prosecuting attorney absolutely destroys the defense here. And I decided that the very best way to get you all to understand exactly what was going on between Zion and Jalen and what happened the night she disappeared was to put together a few minutes of the prosecution's most compelling offense so that you, you all could hear it for yourselves. The heart of this trial is really a, a simple question. Why did this young woman end up in one of these dumpsters and then in all likelihood in this landfill? That is the heart of this case. And through the evidence that you've seen, there is an equally simple explanation, and that's that he murdered her. Now. I told you in my opening statement last week that there's only two people, two people who can tell you exactly what happened inside that house that night, and I don't pretend to be one of them. One of them is Zion, and she's obviously gone, and she can't tell us. The other is the defendant, who if you've seen anything in this trial, you've seen that he has an astonishing capacity for deception. But what I can tell you what I can tell you is that the circumstances in this case, and I'm going to walk through all of the circumstances in this case. The circumstances in this case lead to one inescapable and obvious conclusion, and that's that inside that house that night, there was some sort of sexual encounter that was resisted, and Zion paid for her life because of that and that he put her in that dumpster because he murdered her. Not because she died from a marijuana overdose or an LSD overdose or COVID-19 or death by Prozac or a seizure or any other of the shifting nonsense that you've heard from the defense from the start in this case. She died because he murdered her. Start with the relationship that they had the relationship that he denied from the start but was unearthed in her text messages. He was grooming her. He was grooming her for a sexual relationship and we see that because he acknowledges in one of his interrogations that the basis of their relationship was a shared bond over the fact that she had survived in a, a sexual assault that had gone unreported and he never acknowledges explicitly that he had a sexual interest in her, but, oh, by the way, her friend Alima, the same age of her, he would have gotten with her if the opportunity presented itself, despite that five, six year age gap. And then we have these text messages found on Zion's old phone with the contact that she had for the defendant under the name Fabu, her favorite cousin, under his phone number. And we see thousands of text messages, and we see in these messages that he is moving closer and closer into her life 
and into her business. He offers to get her weed in January of 2021. Let me know if you don't have shit to do later. I'll bring some more weed. May of 2021, when she's, by all appearances, at his house regularly at that time from the context of the messages, do you want me to run a shower, he asks her. He tries to get into her iCloud account, gets her password to her iCloud account. That same month, he asks, do you want to just come over? Because I'm going to be taking Katrina to work soon. May of 2021. And he tells her she can stay there. She can stay at his house. And he reiterates it. Not only on May 23rd, you can always pimp out the basement at my place if need be until you're able to get your own spot, he tells her. And then tells her again a few days later, just keep my place as your plan B. He advises her when she's run away how to evade the police, how to delete evidence from her phone that same month. He's in her business. He, later on, just a month before her death, he's trying to get together with her. You trying to smoke later, he asks her, in December of 2021. And then we see all these sexually explicit messages that he shares at a time when she's primarily 16 years old and he's either 22 or 23, February of 2021. With his 16 year old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault, he sends her pornographic images. March of 2021. With his 16-year-old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault, he tells her, I'm about to be big single. I'm going to get to slang in my meat at my freak bitches again. He tells her that he's in need of some head. That same month, March of 2021, he tells his 16-year-old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault that this little freak is about to gobble me. He tells her in March, I'm sorry, May of 2021, to his 16-year-old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault, that he is a god. He is a god, and he brags that he can get with another girl when his child's mother, his live-in girlfriend, is in the same house. And my girl knows everything she needs to know, he tells his 16-year-old cousin, who is a survivor of sexual assault, and adds that the two women had apparently had sexual relations together. That same month, May of 2021, he tells his cousin, who is a 16-year-old six, girl, who is a survivor of sexual assault, I can really do what I want if I choose to, in the context of sexually explicit discussions. In June of 2021, he tells his 16-year-old cousin, who is a survivor of sexual assault, that he is getting his dick gobbled right now, like right now. He complains to his cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault, that this girl's jaw is getting tired and she's about to be outside in the rain, that he knows of no females that give head properly. Where's the throat goats, he asks his 16-year-old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault. And then he admonishes that Katrina's starting to ask questions, but fear not, because he's about to use manipulation level three. I wonder what that looks like. He tells his 16-year-old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault in July of 2021 that he's on the phone with some girl's sister and she walks in and taught me that he's foul as fuck. He tells his 16-year-old cousin who's a survivor of sexual assault later on that month that he's trying to fuck for real. And then of course writes it off as a mistaken contact, perhaps that was. But these messages are pervasive. They are absolutely pervasive. And then we have other messages where he's commenting on how beautiful she is. He tells her, you're beautiful and smart as fuck. You're a problem, and obviously that's just what it is. He tells her, she's pretty and all, but these guys are on her nuts. He tells her, she always looks gorgeous. One bad day is fine. And then we have these messages commenting about the possibility that they have a relationship, that everyone's kind of grumbling, that there's something going on between them. I wonder why that is. And he reaches out to his 16-year-old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault 
and talks about how he's about to kick his child's mother out of the house. That this bitch swear everybody want to fuck me or I'm just giving dick out. He writes to his 16-year-old cousin who is a survivor of sexual assault. And then it queries with her. God, you know, a lot of people are saying we're in a relationship. What do you think about that? <clears throat> Why do you think he's asking her that? That's some high school level stuff. People are grumbling that we're in a relationship. What do you think about that? And his girlfriend has some oddball jealousy thing with you, he says. Like, why? And then we see on his phone that's recovered during the short period from when he got released on the Macomb County case until he was arrested on this case. And what do we find on his phone? We find videos depicting the rape of young women. We find comic books depicting the rape of young women. We find specific cousin-themed pornography on that phone with specific search terms for black cousin, specific search terms for real plus step cousin, and then all the videos that come along with that. Watch me fuck my step cousin on her parents' bed. Me and my step cousin-in-law get caught fucking deep anal, my step-cousin doggy while my step-aunt is not at home. This tells you what's in his mind about Zion Foster. This tells you what his intentions were when he brought her to his house late at night on January 4th of 2022, behind the back of his pregnant girlfriend, who was at work at the time. He brought Zion over to his house late that night and she leaves that house in the trunk of his car on a night where he has an unexplained gash on his collarbone. What do you think happened inside that house that night? She died of COVID? She died of a seizure? And all the evidence tells us, and I'm going to walk through the timeline, the timeline that he never wanted anybody to see because his initial impulse was what? It was to deny that he was ever with her that night. But all the forensic evidence, all the videos tell us that they were together and he was the last person with her. 10 o'clock p.m., his phone is consistent with being where? It's at his house. It's in the area of his house on the west side of Detroit. 10.20 p.m., her phone is consistent with being where? It's at her house in East Point on the east side. 10.42 p.m., his phone is consistent with being in the area of where it's right in the area of her home. And you can see the path that he follows. He goes to Hazel Park from his phone, pops up, drops off Katrina Smith at work that night, and then he goes straight where? He goes to Zion Foster's home. And he's there in that area by 10.42 p.m. when lo and behold, a car is seen pulling up to her house at that exact time. A car that looks exactly like his car. 10.48 p.m., his phone is still consistent with being in the area of Zion Foster's home. 10.52 p.m., Vertez Gonzalez, who testified that he heard the defendant's voice on the phone when Zion was in the car, he testified, I don't want to be on the phone. I'm sorry, he texted Zion, I don't want to be on the phone when you're with your cousin at 10.52, right after she would have gotten into that car. 10.53 p.m., he has further text messages corroborating his testimony. He says, not trying to have shit weird. I want you to have your times. You confirmed it was him. I heard Bro's voice, so it's cool. He heard the defendant's voice. 11.15 p.m., the defendant's car is now back in his driveway, and you can see the passenger side door open of that car in that driveway at 11.15 p.m. And you can see there's two people, two people going into the house, one taller, one shorter. That is the defendant and that is Zion Foster, the last image of her alive. 11.16 p.m., sure enough, his phone is consistent with being right there in the area of his house. 11.24 p.m., her phone is consistent with being where? In the area of his house because that's when Vertez Gonzalez took that screenshot of her location sharing. 11.34 p.m., Zion's phone is still consistent with being at the defendant's house. 
All this data shows that they're together. 12.03 a.m. This is where you can start to see the deception at play. Katrina Smith messages the defendant, how are you feeling? He responds, tired, probably going to smoke a little and go to sleep. It's a lie. Why is it a lie? Because he doesn't mention that he has his 17-year-old cousin, who she's jealous of, over the house in the middle of the night behind her back. It's deception. 12.03 a.m. Vertez Gonzalez messages Zion, what time are you going home? She replies, we finna smoke again. Does it sound like somebody who's committing suicide that night? She's out hanging out with her cousin, she's gonna smoke again. Does that sound like someone who's just gonna spontaneously kill herself? Victim texts a screenshot from her phone at 12.09 a.m. She texts that to Vertez Gonzalez and it shows her where. It shows her at the defendant's house. It's just a mirror image because that's how FaceTime calls are before they connect it. You get an inverted image. She's in his living room. 12.23 a.m. Katrina Smith messages the defendant. She doesn't feel good, but how's your high? 12.36 a.m. He responds to her, relaxing as fuck, actually fell asleep. Another lie. Why is it a lie? Because he doesn't mention, again, that there's someone else there. There's something else that he is up to that night that he does not want Katrina Smith to know about. 12.59 a.m., Zion Foster's last outgoing text message. On my way home, she writes to Vertez Gonzalez. On my way home. Again, does that sound like someone who was about to spontaneously kill herself as... One of the arguments that the defense has raised in this case. You can see a pattern up until this point in these communications. There's nothing out of the ordinary about Zion's communication. She's out hanging out with her cousin. She's smoking weed. She's about to go home. The defendant's communications, you see a pattern of deception. Because he's hiding the fact that she is there from the person that is closest to him in his life. We move on to 1.08 p.m., I'm sorry, a.m. on January 5th, and Zion's phone is still consistent with being in the area of the defendant's house. But then 1.15 a.m., the phone suddenly drops from the cellular network. Just vanishes. All the data is suddenly gone. And that only happens because of one of several things. The phone is off, the phone's on airplane mode, or the phone is damaged beyond repair. This isn't accidental that the phone just goes off the network at this point. 1.25 a.m., this is where it starts to get really interesting. Katrina Smith, who's pregnant at the time, writes, I think I need to come home. I don't feel good. The defendant's response, a few minutes later, 1.28 a.m., you can make it, baby. Why doesn't he want to go pick her up at that point? because he's just killed his cousin. 1.48 a.m. You can see his car pulls out of the driveway and then it creeps all the way to the back of the driveway, away from the view of the road for the most part. 1.45 a.m. His phone still puts him right there at the house. He's still there. 1.48 a.m. The car is parked in back by now. There's a person, by all accounts, the defendant, who emerges from the house. He gets in the car, and then the light goes on. He's putting her body in the trunk at that point. A minute later, the car pulls off. And where does the car go from there? Where does the defendant's phone go from there? It goes straight to a parking lot full of dumpsters in Highland Park. You can see the trajectory following along the lodge, and the phone stays there. It stays in that parking lot for several minutes by those dumpsters. And you can see on the video that at around that same time, when you correct for the time differential, that a car pulls right up to that dumpster, and the lights on that car cut out in the middle of the night. And he wants you to believe he's there for totally innocent reasons. 
you can see a few minutes later that there's activity by that dumpster. It's hard to see because he cut out his lights. But you can see there's legs moving around right by that dumpster. And that's the dumpster, by the way, that he says, ultimately, weeks later, after her body is long gone, he finally says, yes, I put her there. Two oh eight a.m. His phone's still consistent with being there in the area of the dumpster. Two twelve a.m. He finally messages Katrina Smith. She had texted him again at one thirty-two a.m. saying, "My stomach hurts and I feel sick and I keep getting hot and cold." But he had to dispose of Zion Foster's body, so he wasn't in a position to respond to that message. He finally responds at two twelve a.m after disposing of Zion Foster's body. And he finally says, okay, baby, do you want me to come now? He then follows up, I'll hop in the shower to kick this high off. Why is he hopping in the shower in the middle of the night for innocent reasons after disposing of a body? 2.15 a.m. You can see his car pull back into his driveway. And sure enough, at around that same time, his phone is consistent with having come directly from that parking lot full of dumpsters right back to his house. 2.21 a.m., just after disposing of Zion Foster's body, at 2.21 a.m., just after getting home, you can see he's probably gotten in the shower maybe taking his shirt off and seeing the extent of the damage that she did to him when she resisted. And what does he say about that? He says that Nyla, the cat, scratched my neck. He says, I was trying to tickle her stomach and she beat my ass. But what is, what is the person who is closest to him at that time say? Katrina Smith, who he later went to pick up from work and brought home that night. What did she say? Well, we'll get to that in a second, but what else do you think could have scratched him like that? Who else do you think could have scratched him? Could it have been Zion Foster who had her nails like that? Because as Katrina says, she saw a scratch that night. She testified that she saw a scratch when they got home together. She saw a scratch on his collarbone. And what did she say about that scratch? She said, and I quote, it was a big scratch. And I asked her whether that was something ordinary for the cat to do. And she said, and I quote, the cat, quote, never scratched that deep before to draw that much blood. That's an exact quote from Katrina Smith, the person who he did not want to testify at this case. What did she also say? She said that he seemed normal that night. He wasn't in a state of panic. He was behaving as though he had just committed a cold-blooded killing that he was covering up. That's how he was behaving. There were so many things here to note that were strange and perverted. Jalen Frazier was obsessed with the idea of trying to get his cousin to have relations with him. So much so that he was willing to risk his family his freedom and Zion's life to get it. After deliberating for less than one hour, they returned a verdict of guilty. Only then did he manage to show some type of emotion in court. Now, whether it was emotion from the heart or whether he was just putting on a show, well, the world may never know. But after the guilty verdict, Jalen Brazier returned to court once again, where Judge Donald Knapp read him his fate. The defendant is sentenced to 38 to 90 years with a consecutive sentence of 5 to 10 years on count 2 with credit for 356 days served. This means that Jalen Brazier will spend anywhere from 43 to 100 years in prison for the murder of his favorite cousin, Zion Foster. Unfortunately, even after an extensive and exhaustive search of five months that included searching a massive landfill in hazmat suits and 90 degree weather in Detroit, 
Zion Foster's body was never found. This means that the only person that truly knows everything that he did to Zion before taking her treasured life is the deranged and perverted monster, Jalen Brazier himself. The only thing Zion's family is now left with are her memories. Sadly, may Zion Foster find rest for her soul and Jalen Brazier find none. Thank you for watching.